Chapter 10, items 19 and 23. I've decided to do um, 19 and 23 only from the remaining problems of Chapter 10 simply because they model help me model certain things that haven't been demonstrated in previous examples. Um, and the other items um, at the end of this textbook chapter are similar to things that we've already covered. So 19 and 23 include um, a one-tail test and then also um, conducting a hypothesis test using raw score data. So number 19, uh, numerous studies have found that males report higher self-esteem than females, especially for adolescents. Um, typical research results show a mean self-esteem score of 39 with sum of square deviations equal to 60.2 for a sample of 10 male adolescents and a mean of 35.4 with SS equal to 69.4 for a sample of 10 female adolescents. Do the results indicate that self-esteem is significantly higher for males? Um, use a one-tail test with alpha of 0.01. So again, because that we are testing for significance in um, testing whether males are higher in self-esteem, again, we should see that we are instructed to do a one-tail test. So let's first begin with our research and our null hypothesis. As I've stated before, I find it easier when we are conducting a um, uh, one-tail test hypothesis that it's easier to state and begin with the research because the direction of that test is um, on our mind and that's what we're thinking about. So again, we're testing to see if self-esteem of males is higher than the self-esteem of females. So our notation again of um, the male population, the data was presented first, we would say that um, the population average self-esteem for males is greater than the average self-esteem for females. Now for the, the null, we would state that the self-esteem of males is, and again, opposite of higher, less than and then you always have to include the equal, less than or equal to the self-esteem of females. And again, population one males average self-esteem scores would be less than or equal to the self-esteem of females or we can say if we took the male self-esteem score and subtracted um, the average um, self-esteem value for females that would equal something less than or equal to zero right if it's less than zero it'd be negative again implying that the first value is um, less than the second um, I, I neglected to do the same over here this would be or the self-esteem of males minus self-esteem of females will be greater than zero again implying that the first value is higher all right so we've um, established what our research and nulls um, hypothesis would look like next given the parameters of the test one tail that um, alpha 0.01 let's find our critical T. To do so, we're going to need to figure out what our degrees of freedom is equal to. So degrees of freedom N1 minus 1 plus N2 minus 1. So we were told that we have a, a, a sample of 10 males and a sample of 10 females. So this would become 10 minus 1 plus 10 minus 1. We get 9 plus 9 and that's equal to 18. So we have degrees of freedom equal to 18. Now we can find our critical T. 
t-value using our t-distribution. Okay, so here we are in our t-distribution. We go to degrees of freedom equal to 18. We're conducting a one-tailed test, so we're going to use this tier at 0.01. There's 0.01 there. And now we're going to find where those intersect um, to find our critical t-value. And we find that's equal to 2.552. And um, it's not positive negative because it's not a two-tailed test. It would be positive because we anticipate that the males will have higher self-esteem than the females. So the mean difference would be a positive value. Okay, so again, our critical t is positive 2.552 according to our t um, table. And again, it's positive because we expect the first population, the males, to have a higher value than the females. So it would be greater than zero, um, and that would be the cutoff um, value for our critical region. Okay, so continuing, we're going to need to calculate our t statistic. It's equal to our sample 1 minus our sample 2, the mean difference, minus the hypothesized population um, mean difference coming from the null. It's always equal to 0. Excuse me, not uh, 2. And divided by our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Okay, we're going to set our parameters given their critical t value. So again, in the center we have um, the null, which says that the mean difference will equal to zero. And we just set our critical t at um, positive 2.552. Now we're going to calculate our t. Obviously we need our estimate standard error of the mean difference, but to get that we first need to calculate our pool variance. So our pool variance is equal to SS, and I'm using this equation because we were given our SS values. Um, SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. And if we re reference back to our values, um, our SS value for our males was equal to 60.2. Again, that was a given. And um, the SS for females was 69.4. 69.4. And we divide that by degrees of freedom for, for our first distribution. 10 minus 1 is 9. 10 minus 1 is 9. And now we can calculate our pooled variance, pooled variance in our calculators. Um, 60.2 added to 69.4, we get 129.6 divided by 9 plus 9 is 18. And now we have a pooled variance, so 129.6 divided by 18 we get 7.2. Now using that we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Notice that you know again that each statistic leads to the next. Our equation is pooled variance, the square root of the pooled variance for divided by sample 1 added to the pooled variance divided by our sample 2 sample size. So if we replace variables, we get 7.2 over 10 added to 7.2 over 10. Okay, and then 7.2 divided by 10 gives us 0.72 plus 0.72. Um, so we're get, looking for the square root of 1.44. And the square root of 1.44 in our calculators gives us 1.2. Okay, so now we've calculated the estimated standard error, the mean difference. Again, by definition, that is the average difference we would expect between sample one, mean 1 minus 
the mean of sample 2 if the null were true, the null stating that those differences are equal to 0. All right, so we have our estimated standard error of the mean difference. We can use that to solve for t. Um, go back to our t equation. So t is equal to the um, self-esteem average score for males, which was equal to 39. Again, that was a given. Minus the self-esteem average score for females was 35.4. Again, all of that was given on the previous page. And then minus what um, the anticipated population mean difference would equal, according to the null, and that's equal to 0. Divide by what we just calculated, our estimated standard error of the mean difference, 1.2. So the mean difference is 39 minus 35.4 is 3.6. 3.6 divided by 1.2. And that gives us a t value, a t statistic equal to 3. Okay, and um, I forgot to shade in again. This is my critical region. Anything, any t value greater than 2.552 will put me in the critical region. So now we have our t statistic to draw our conclusion, and we again find where this resides. It would be in the critical region. We are happy given um, the null hypothesis that we stated that there would um, males self esteem would actually be less than or equal to that um, the self-esteem of females, and here we've shown that their self-esteem is actually larger. The mean difference is a positive number, and it falls in the critical region. So again, that t-statistic is e expressing um, the mean difference in standard error units, or estimated standard error units. We'll continue with this problem to calculate confidence interval, and then draw our conclusions. Continuing with that same example, we're going to calculate a 95% confidence interval. It's the estimated population mean difference that we would anticipate if the null were um, rejected. And our equation is the mu1 minus mu2 is equal to our sample statistic difference added and subtracted to the product of our t and it's not our t statistic, um, it's coming from our confidence interval percentage, multiplied by the estimated standard error of the mean difference. And we're going to replace the variables that we know. So mu1 minus mu2 is equal to, the male self-esteem score was equal to, or their average was 39, minus that of the females, 35.4 plus or minus our t value multiplied by our estimated standard error of the mean difference, which was equal to 3 in this case. Oh, excuse me, not 3. That was our t. 1.2. 1.2. All right, well, let's um, simplify this a little bit further. And so the difference between 39 and 35.4 is equal to 3.6. So mu1 minus mu2 is equal to the mean difference of, sample mean difference of 3.6 plus or minus our t value multiplied by our estimated standard error of the mean difference, which is 1.2. All right, so now we need to figure out what that t is equal to. Again, we're talking about. Um, 95% of the mean differences in the center. What's left over is 5%. So again, we're, we're going to calculate a value here and a value here. But we need a t-value to, to enter into this equation to solve for those means. Um, and we take that 5%, divide by 100 to give us a proportion of 0 0.05. And now we're going to use that along with our degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom for this problem is equal to 18. So given those two things and the process of a two-tailed test because we're calculating two values, one above and one below, um, the mean difference. And again, in the center we have 3.6.
um, we're going to find what that t value is equal to from our t distribution. Okay, so in our t distribution, our critical, excuse me, our degrees of freedom is equal to 18. And we were looking for 5% for the two tailed process for a confidence interval. So 5%. And we're just going to see where those intersect. And we get t is equal to 2.101, positive or negative. Well, that's taken care of in our equation, but it's 2.101. Okay, so now we know this t, so I'm going to erase this and, and then enter that value that we just uh, found in our t distribution. Our t value is 2.101, and then that's multiplied by our estimated standard error of the mean difference of 1.2. So again, we found that um, t statistic for here and here, which now will enable us to calculate the mean, the anticipated population mean difference using this equation. So I'm going to erase this down here so we can draw another distribution. Okay, so just to kind of clarify what we're doing, given the sample mean difference, that sample mean difference was equal to 3.6. And now we're going to calculate a value here and here, given this equation. So then we can say we're 95% confident that if we had access to population data for both populations, the difference between those populations would be centered around 3.6 and something above and something below. So this becomes um, mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 3.6 plus or minus the product of these two values. 2.1 in our calculators, 2.101 multiplied by 1.2 is equal to 2.521. We ran three digits right at the decimal. So now again, we're going to add um, 2.521 to 3.6 and subtract it from 3.6 to get our range of values. So if we add it, um, if we add 2.521 to 3.6 in our calculators, we should get 6.121. And if we subtract it, we get 1.079. Okay, so 3.6 minus 2.521. 1.79, 1.079. So now we've calculated a range. Again, this is the, you can think of it as the default that given the sample, how the samples performed and what the mean difference was, that's a good indication of what the population mean difference is. Again, inferential statistics using sample data to draw conclusions about a population. Now we're 95% confident that the true population mean difference resides between 1.079 and 6.121. Where is zero? Zero would be over here somewhere on the number line. Um, let's just say zero here. That's the null. And again, our range does not include that value. So again, it's another um, indication that we are accurate in rejecting the null hypothesis that there is a difference in um, self-esteem between males and females. So again, we're 95% confident that the true population mean difference falls within the values of 1.079 and 6.121. So again, if we had access to the population data, the mean difference um, would be somewhere in that range. Again, not including zero. So um, affirming the rejection of the null, rejecting the null hypothesis. So now we're going to um, write our concluding statement. All right, so we know given what we calculated on the previous page, we get to reject um, reject the null. Our t statistic fell in the critical region. Results 
indicate that the self-esteem of males is significantly higher than the self-esteem of females. And again, this is pertaining to the population of adolescent males and females. Um, just, just to point that out, that distinction. And we would um, identify what type of test we conducted. We conducted a t-test where degrees of freedom Degrees of freedom were equal to 18, and our T statistic was equal to 3, and uh, the probability of obtaining that um, T value is less than our alpha of 0 .01, 0 0.01, and then we conduct we calculated a 95% confidence interval. And the range of that interval was 1.079 through 6.121 in period. Um, what I'd like to do now, I'm going to erase some of this. In, even though it wasn't asked for, I'm going to calculate D and R square. Okay, so again, this wasn't asked in this question, but um, just to, for purposes of giving you more examples, D, estimated D is equal to the sample mean difference over the square root of our pooled variance. So we have um, the mean difference, which we've already established um, over, um, in previous processes, is 3.6. Again, it was the male's um, average score minus the female's average score, and that was 3.6. Over the um, square root of our pooled variance, our pooled variance was equal to 7.2. So in our calculators, 3.6, 3.6 divided by 7.2, the square root of 7.2, and we get 1.34, which is very high, high effect. Oops. Um, and so what we're saying is that the null says that the mean difference would equal zero. Zero and the mean difference given the, the sample statistics was equal to 3.6. This is the population mean difference. And now we're saying this sh the shift is equal to 1.34 standard deviation units. Okay, so that's very significant. Anything over 0.8 is considered very high effect. R squared, the percentage of difference in scores. Um, due to treatment. Here there was no treatment um, administered. What we would then say that the percentage of change is due to a difference in gender. A difference in gender. So this is our equation for R squared. So our T statistic was equal to 3. 3 squared over 3 squared plus 18, which is our degrees of freedom. So we have 9 over 9 plus 18. So we have 9 over 27, and we get, I believe, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, which is also considered high effect. So we would say 33% of the difference in self-esteem scores is due to a difference in gender. So again, we're, it's a quasi-independent variable. We weren't administering a treatment. We're just comparing the difference between males and females, a quasi-independent variable. So I just want to give you those additional statistics um, to model um, the application of estimated D and R squared and explain what they represent. All right, 23. 
Researchers evaluated soccer players and swimmers to determine whether the routine blows to the head experienced by soccer players produced long-term neurological deficits. In the study, neurological tests were administered to mature soccer players and swimmers, and the test result the results indicated significant differences. In a similar study, researchers obtained the following data. A. Are, neuro are the neurological test scores significantly lower for the soccer players and for the swimmers in the control group? And use a one-tailed test with alpha of 0 0.05. Now, since the um, author of the text put swimmers first and soccer players second, um, it's going to alter how I write the research and null hypothesis. Again, they're saying that we test to see if soccer players have um, lower neurological test scores. But again, given that the how they've set this up, this is um, population one and this is population two. So I have to word it according to how it's set up here, um, which doesn't change things, but I just want to explain why I'm not um, specifying the soccer players in the research and null hypothesis. So again, as I've indicated before, I find it easier to verbalize the research um, because of the fact that that's the direction that we have um, on our mind. So if we're saying that the soccer players will produce lower neurological test scores than given population one, we would also um, equate that to neurological test scores test scores to be higher for swimmers and then for soccer players. So neuro neurological test scores um, of swimmers are higher than those of soccer players. So population one is greater than population two, or if we took the mean neurological test scores for swimmers, it would, um, and then minus the mean neurological test scores for soccer players, it would be greater than zero because our first value is higher. So that means that the null would state that the neurological test scores of swimmers are less than or equal to the scores of soccer players. So our notation would state that mu1 is less than or equal to mu2 or mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to zero. So if it's less than zero, it means that um, mu1 is less than the second mu, um, or we would equate it to there. there's no difference. So again, I had to state it that way simply because they put the swimmer scores first. Um, if they had flipped it, then I could have stated it differently, and we would be looking at it, the negative side of the distribution. Regardless, we can still continue with this um, test. We're going to find what our critical critical t is equal to, given the parameters of the test. It's a one-tailed test at alpha 0 0.05. We need to figure out what degrees of freedom are equal to. So degrees of freedom for our first distribution, n1 minus 1. So we have um, how many in our swimming group? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So n is equal to 8 for our first distribution. It's freedom 1 is equal to 8. Well, n is equal to 8. 8 minus 1. Minus 1 gives us 7. And then for our second distribution, n 2 minus 1 degrees of freedom 2 is equal to we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 individuals in that group. So 5 minus 1 gives us 4. So our combined degrees of freedom 
would equal 7 plus 4, and that gives us 11. So given that value and the parameters of our test, we're going to find what critical t is equal to. Okay, so our degrees of freedom equal to 11. We're going to use the one-tailed tier at 5% and see where those two things um, intersect and we get 1.796. Again, since we anticipate the first population to be greater than the second population, we anticipate a positive mean difference, so we're going to use the positive version of that critical t. So our critical t is equal to 1.796 positive, again, because we anticipate the swimmers to be higher in their neurological test scores compared to the soccer players. Um, so again, we've just set our parameters. The null is in the middle. Expect that difference to equal zero. And our critical region is defined by 1.796. That's our critical region. So we'll use that again in the next process um, in our calculations. All right, so we'll see with this example, we're not given mean, we're not given variance, standard deviation, SS, none of those statistics are available to us. So this is um, a good example of what the real world would look like when you're conducting research. You yourself collect this data and now you have your X values. So we're going to re reference our um, calculations for mean and SS from chapters 3 and 4. So first we're going to calculate the mean of our first distribution and then the mean for our second distribution. So we have, um, again, these are the swimmers of our first distribution, so we know that the mean is equal to sum of x over n. So we're going to take the sum of x here. So if we add all of those up, um, 10 plus 8, so on and so forth, we get a sum of 72. 72. And we know from before that our sample size is equal to 8. So we have an average neurological test score of 9. Let's do the same for our soccer player. So it's the sum of x for a second distribution over our sample size. So if we take the sum of x, the sum of x here, we get um, a total of 30. So 30 over our sample size, we have five individuals. So we get an average test score, neurological test score of six. So again, here we see a difference, sample one being larger than sample two. Next, we're going to calculate um, SS using the computational formula. So SS is the sum of x squared minus the sum of x squared over n. Some of these things we already know, so let's go ahead and replace variables. So we know the sum of x. We just calculated that. That's 72. We're going to square that. We know what n is equal to. It's 8. Now what's missing is the sum of squared deviations. So let's figure out what that would be. So to do so, we're going to need to calculate um, the square of all of these, and I'm going to pause and write those down. Okay, so I went ahead and squared all my values. So my x values include 10, 8, 7, 9, so on and so forth. And now I've squared all of those values so that I can get this variable, the sum of my x values that have been squared. Again, this is all review from Chapter 4. And that should give us a total of 692. 692. So we're going to enter that into our equation. And now SS... We take 72, square it, divide by 8, and subtract it from 692. We should get SS is equal to 44. We're going to do the same over here with our soccer players. Okay, so we're going to calculate SS for our soccer players. Again, the sum of, and this is for our second distribution, sum of x2 squared minus the sum of x2 squared again, that's just the subnotation, and to be proper, I should um, include that over here. That was my first distribution numbers for my first distribution, so SS1. All right, so going back here, um, we'll replace variables, SS 
for our second distribution, we know what the sum of x is. That was part of our mean equation, which is equal to 30. We're going to square that. n is equal to 5. And now we need the sum of all our x values that have been squared. So I've already squared them for you to save a little time. We should get a value of 204. 204 is the sum of all x values in our second distribution that have been squared. So if we take 30 and we square it, divide by 5, and subtract it from 204, the SS for our second distribution is equal to 24. Now having those values, I can now calculate my pooled variance. Pooled variance is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over DF1 plus DF, oops, DF2. I'm just going to replace variables. So SS1, 44, SS2, 24, and um, DF1 is equal to 7, plus DF2 is equal to five, 4, 4, yes, 4. All right, so we can calculate this, 44. This is our pooled variance calculation, 44 plus 24 divided by 11. And we get 6.18 is our pooled variance. Again, all what we're doing is moving towards being able to calculate our t-statistic. That's the ultimate goal. And here's an example of, again, we have all our x values, so you have to recall the skills of calculating the mean, the sum of squared deviations, um, and so that we can calculate pooled variance. Now with this, I can calculate the estimated standard error of the mean difference, because I have my pooled variance. The equation is the square root of our pooled variance over n1 plus pooled variance over n2. I'm going to replace variables, um, and my equation would then be the square root of six point one eight over eight, and then added to 6.18 over my sample size um, was 5. Okay, so if we take them as separate, whoops, separate um, proportions, 6.18 divided by 8, um, I believe it's a 1.236, added to 6.18 divided by Five. Whoops, that's not correct. Give me one second here. I was doing them backwards. So 6.18 divided by 8 is 0 0.7, 0 0.7725 added to 6.18 divided by 5 is 1.236. And that is equal to the square root of, we get 2.0085. We take the square root of that. Essentially, it's the square root of 2 for rounding through, um, um, rounding three digits right the decimal. Well, it would be 2.009 but close to 2, and we would get, um, we round three digits right at the decimal, 1.42, 1 1.42, if we round. And we actually get 1.417 in your calculator, so we're going to round it two digits right at the decimal, 1.42, and that's the average mean difference we would expect um, between sample one and sample two, swimmers and soccer players and neurological test scores, if the null were true. Okay, so now we have everything we need to calculate our t-statistic to answer that initial question, if the mean difference was statistically significantly different from what we would anticipate um, if the null were true. So our equation is as follows. We have everything we need to calculate our t. 
So our mean difference, so the swimmers had an average test score of nine, the soccer players six, minus the anticipated population mean difference coming from the null is equal to zero, over our um, estimated standard error of the mean difference, which we just calculated to equal 1.42. So t is equal to 9 minus 6 divided by 1.42, and we get a t statistic equal to 2.11. We're going to go back to what our um, critical region was set at. We had a critical region. So in the center, the null says that these two populations would not be different, the swimmers and the soccer players. And we set a critical region um, of 1.796 that defined our critical region for this particular test. And um, this, you know, if we have a t value in the critical region, we get to reject. So in this case, we see that this t value does fall into the critical region. We're happy we get to reject the null. Right? The probability of obtaining that um, t value is p is less than our alpha, which is was set at 0 0.05 or 5 percent. So what we're going to do next is calculate our r squared, and I think I'll also do um, the example of d. Why don't we go ahead and do that right now? So d. If we were to calculate our estimated Cohen's d, d is mean 1 minus mean 2 over the square root of our pooled variance. So we have 9 minus 6. And our pooled variance, if we go back um, to our previous statistics, our pooled variance was 6.18. So you can go back and reference that. Um, so 9 minus 6 is 3, so 3 divided by 6.18, or the square root of 6.18. We get a um, Cohen's d equal to, if we round two digits right to the decimal, we get 1.21. So the mean difference, um, so we're talking about the anticipated mean difference coming from the null was, was 0. We had a mean difference equal to 3, 3. That was the population mean difference given the sample statistics. And now we're expressing that as a, a shift of 1.1 standard deviation units. Okay, now we're going to calculate um, R squared on the next page. So our R squared is equal to T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. Our t statistic um, was equal to 2.11, we're going to square that, over 2.11 squared, plus our degrees of freedom, um, our combined degrees of freedom were, was equal to 11. So 2.11 squared gives us 4.45. 2, 1, and then added to 11, that would be 15.4521. So r squared is equal to 4.4521 divided by 15.4521, and we should get something like 0.288. Um, or we could say if we rounded or 0.29, and we could say that what we've just calculated is that 29% um, of the difference in neurological test scores is attributed to the difference in sports played. So again, there wasn't um, 
um, a treatment being administered, we were comparing a quasi-independent variable, soccer players versus swimmers. So now we're seeing 29% of the difference in neurological test scores is, um, is accounted for, attributed to the difference in the sport that they are playing, and that's considered a large effect. Similarly to that Cohen's D we calculated, that was also a very large um, effect size. And now I'm just going to draw our final conclusions. Okay, so to draw our conclusions, we would say that we, re we get to reject the null. The null said that the neurological test scores would be equal, um, equal or in fact that the swimmers would have um, lesser, uh, a smaller score than the soccer players. Um, so we reject that idea. The results indicate that neurological test scores of swimmers are significantly higher than those of, of soccer players and we conducted a t-test with degrees of freedom equal to 11 our t-value was equal to 2.11 the probability of obtaining that t-value if the null were true is less than a 5% chance and our um, R squared was equal to 0.29. We also calculated D. Uh, normally you wouldn't see both, but since we did calculate it, I believe it was 1.21. And that would be our concluding statement.